we will. So we're going to begin, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I, I want to read it uh, in a yes, couple sir, of Just a minute. Uh -huh. Just a minute. Pastor Innocent is requesting you to let him in. Oh, I'm not letting him in. <laughs> he's, he's tried to get in several times. <laughs> you have to come through the sheepfold. <laughs> <laughs> Did you make it? Is that Pastor Innocent? Yes, I'm the one. I was locked outside. <laughs> you were locked out? <laughs> I'm glad you could join us today. Very, very, very glad to see you and to be with you. Well, I'm going to start. I'm going to uh, read if it's okay. I want to read in two translations. You know, I don't ever think you can read it enough. Yes. You know, I've probably read chapter 10 uh, just in the past week, maybe 10, 15 times. So, you know, I just, I love the word. So I like to read it in different translations. So I'm going to read it in one translation, and then I'm going to read it in the message, which is a paraphrase. Does everybody know what a paraphrase is? It's not a literal translation. It's It's taken the literal translation and putting it in today's language. So you have a, a translation and a paraphrase. So let me read uh, from uh, the New King James, verse, verse 1, chapter 10. So Paul is writing and he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And I'll explain that later, because it wasn't a rock that literally followed them in their journey. And that rock was Christ. Now that's true. That's literal. The rock didn't, but Christ did. But with most of them, God was not pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Mm -hmm. And do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by serpents, I mean by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our admonition. Here's the key, upon whom the end of the ages have come. Verse 12, therefore let him who stands take heed lest he fall. That's a very good lesson there. A very good lesson. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will make a way of escape that you may bear under it. Verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, Flee Just a minute, uh, Dad. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Pastor Innocent, will you just mute your mic, please? Pastor Innocent? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Sorry, sir. Therefore, my beloved brethren, flee from idolatry. Speak, I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourself what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, 
is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all take of that one bread. And he talks about communion there, but the next chapter will deal with communion because he goes further into it in chapter 11. You know where it says, don't take unworthily? I don't know if you've read that in Corinthians. You know, we always read that when we share the Lord's Supper and we say, yes. you know, search your heart, don't take unworthily. Well, remember, we're already forgiven. Amen. So how can you take unworthily? Mm. Because he's not talking about a person. And we'll talk about that next week. In verse 18, observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? In other words, idols aren't anything. And that's what he talked about in the previous chapter. Rather that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. If you drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons, you cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful, but for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So in other words, eating meat, those type of things we talked about, they're lawful for him, but they're not helpful. Here's what he's trying to say. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. That's a major question, see. Eat whatever sold in the meat market. We talked about that last week. Asking no questions for your conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord in all of its fullness. He's saying, in other words, the cows were made by God, the fullness of the... God made the cow. So when they were on the hoof, they belonged to me. <laughs> and so just because it was offered up to something that didn't exist, it was mine in the first place. So don't let it bother your conscience. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, that's so awesome. An unbeliever having dinner with a lost person. We're talking about evangelism and you desire to go, eat whatever is put before you, asking no question for your conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, that was offered to an idol, then don't eat it for the sake of the one who told you. Conscious, uh, for your conscience, verse 29, conscious, I say not your own, but the others. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food which I gave thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, giving no offense. That's how you give glory to God, either to the Jews or the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Evangelism. <laughs> you know, Paul's very concerned about evangelism uh, in everything that he writes. He's very concerned about reaching the city of Corinth. And, you know, I think what happens to churches today, we get very concerned about our church, but forget the purpose. You know, the purpose of growing people spiritually is not just for them to be spiritual. <laughs> the purpose of having spiritual people is so that we can affect our community with the kingdom of God. Amen. And But what happens is we get focused on the wrong thing. We get focused on the size of our church, the size of our budget, how big is the building. Uh, you know, we get focused on the wrong, the focus, the purpose that your church exists is to, is, is to usher in the kingdom of God into that area, which is evangelism, bringing people into the kingdom. 
And so you have to be careful of the testimony of your church. Be careful of your testimony. Be careful of what you do. People are watching you. Why? I mean, if you're forgiven, and you are, and you're the righteous of God in Jesus, and you are, then what? why be concerned? Mm -hmm. You're already forgiven. Why be concerned if you eat meat and it offends somebody? Because it's not about you. It's about reaching your community. Amen. You've already been dealt with with the blood of Jesus. Your sins have been taken care of. But it's about something much bigger than that. It's much bigger than just a church or just, it's about reaching our communities. And I, I, I'm telling you, when a church gets away from evangelism, troubles around the corner. That comes from 45 years of experience, not just what the Bible teaches, but from experience. Listen, when we get our eyes off our purpose, our eyes are going to focus on something else. And if our purpose is the kingdom of God, which it is, and we get our eyes off of that, establishing the kingdom in your area, then we begin to get out of balance. And so all of a sudden, we, we overemphasize the gifts, just like what happened in the church of Corinth. The gifts became everything. Their wisdom became everything. And, and what happened? Immorality, division. You know, look at all the things that happened because they lost their focus. Paul never loses his focus. <laughs> Paul keeps his focus. It's about reaching the community. Now, I'm going to read the same thing out of the message. And this is a paraphrase, so it's, it, it's, but it's really good. I like it. it. It'll help you to understand what we just read. So he says, remember our history, friends, and be warned. All of our ancestors were led by the providential cloud and then taken through the sea. They went through the waters in a baptism like ours. As Moses led them from enslaving death to salvation life. They all ate and drank identical food and drink. Meals provided daily by God. And they drank from the rock. God's fountain, for them that stayed with them everywhere they were, and the rock was Jesus. But just experiencing God's wonder of grace didn't seem to mean much. Wow. Just experiencing God's wonder and his grace of the Red Seas and quail and manna, it didn't seem to be much because most of them were defeated by temptation during the hard times in the desert. They got focused on the difficulty and not on God's provision. And it says, and because of that, God wasn't pleased. The same thing could happen to us. Wow. <laughs> this is inspired by God, by the way. This is, this is God's message to us. So we get our focus off and we begin to have difficulty and uh, the same thing can happen to us that happened to Israel. We must be on guard so that we never get caught up in wanting our own way as they did. Mm. We must not turn our religion into a circus as they did. First, the people partied. Then they threw a dance. We must not be sexually promiscuous. They paid for that. Remember, with 23,000 deaths in one day. Mm. We must never try to get Christ to serve us. Instead, we're serving him. They tried it, and God launched an epidemic of poisonous snakes. We must be careful not to stir up discontent. Discontent destroyed them. These are all just warning markers, danger in our history books, written down so that we don't repeat their mistake. Our position in the story is parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end. And we are just as capable of messing up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident. 
you're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face just as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. Amen. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to do is remember God won't let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. So my dear friends, when you see people reducing God to something that they can use or control, get out of their comp company as fast as you can. I assume I'm addressing believers who are now mature. Draw your conclusions. When we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? And isn't the same loaf of bread that we break and eat, don't we take ourselves the body, the very life of Christ? Because there's one loaf. Our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. I have a piece of the loaf. You have a piece of the loaf. That doesn't mean Christ is fragmented. What he's saying is, I have a piece of the loaf, you have a piece of the loaf, that makes us one loaf of bread. So we become unified. We don't reduce Christ, uh, uh, we don't reduce Christ to what we are. He raises us to what he is. And that's what happened even in old Israel. Those who ate the sacrifice, offered on God's altar, entered into God's actions on the altar. Uh, let me go to the very end. So eat your meals heartily. Don't worry about what others say about you. <laughs> You're eating to God's glory. After all, not to please what people might say about you. As a matter of fact, do everything that way, heartily and freely, to God's glory. I try my best to be considerate of everyone's feelings in these matters. I hope you will too. <clears throat> wow, what an awesome chapter. Uh, we're going to learn a lot today. <laughs> First of all, he starts off in verse one. He says, moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the cloud and all pass through the sea. That word moreover, I don't know if you write in your Bible or take notes, but that word moreover is referring back to the previous part of the letter. He's referring back to the sacrifice to idols that we talked about and the immorality in the church. Remember, we talked about the immorality. We talked about surrendering your rights. Paul says, I have a right to to make a living preaching the gospel there's nothing but i give that up so that yes. you know, nobody's offended yes and that's what he's referring back to so he says moreover brethren i don't want you to be unaware so he says i'm tying all of this together <clears throat> i'm tying all of this together uh talking about the meat offered to idols and he says you know an idol's nothing i've given up my rights you know, I've addressed things in the church that were not right. Uh, and so he says, so moreover, let me go back in history and grab a little of our Israeli history and make a point. You see, mm. he's, he's linking that together. And many times in Paul's writing, uh, where he says, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, Paul uses that a lot. You're going to see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's in Romans, in Thessalonians. And it's, it's a literary approach to say, I'm going to reach back and take our history to make a point. And so that word, moreover, that's all that that moreover, I don't want you to become unaware, brethren. He's saying, now I'm going to take Israel's history and teach you something <clears throat> about idols and things like that. Um, he says, we all pass through the cloud. <coughs> I, I don't know. Have y'all heard the word Shekinah? Yes. Okay. That's a familiar term. I, I didn't know if it was familiar there, but Shekinah is a, a, a rabbi. That's a term that the rabbis came up with. It's a Hebrew term. 
uh, and they called it Shekinah cloud of glory. Yes. That's a typical Jewish way they would say the Shekinah cloud of glory. Shekinah means to dwell with. That's what the word Shekinah means. So Shekinah cloud of glory means that God's glory is dwelling with us. So he talks about this cloud. And you remember I mentioned to you all a couple of weeks ago that it's all about the presence of God. And remember I said, why did God send the cloud? Was God already with them? If the cloud wasn't there, was God with them? Yes. Sure he was. God's omnipresent. God's on the furthest planet right now. Mm. God's presence fills the earth Amen. and the universe. You know, he's omnipresent. That means he is present everywhere all of the time. So was God in the wilderness with Israel? Well, obviously he's omnipresent. So what was the Shekinah cloud of glory? It was a way for them to become aware of the presence of God. And the fire was a way for them to have an awareness, a reminder of God's presence with them. Now, you know, I believe that the cloud of glory is in me. Because I'm a carrier of the presence of God. So God's glory lives in me, right? So God's glory lives in me as a reminder that God's with me. God's glory is also on us, right? As a reminder so that I can be reminded that God is always with me, always with me as a constant mm -hmm. reminder. Now, I want us to look at, in, in your Bible, Numbers chapter 9. Numbers chapter 9. Sorry, I'm a little. Hey, I've been working out. You got it, buddy? Hey. I'm with you now. All right. Numbers chapter 9. Let me read to you. This is about the cloud. Verse 15. I love this passage. On the day the tabernacle, the tent of testimony was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like a fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night, it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they camped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in the camp. When the cloud remained over the, the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only for a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp. Then, at his command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only for an evening till the morning. And when it lifted in the morning, they set out, whether by day or by night. Whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. <clears throat> now, there's a principle here that we need to learn. <laughs> Move with the cloud. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Move with the cloud. Yes. So, the purpose of the cloud was a manifestation of the presence of God. And as long as we remember his presence, we have confidence that he's going to take care of us. Amen. It's a reminder he's going to take care of us because we know in him all things are taken care of. So in the cloud, whenever they would fight the enemy, the Lord would fight for them. Protection was in the cloud. Provision was in the cloud. 
in Amen. the cloud over Israel is where the quail would come. In the cloud is where they would have water coming from a rock. In the cloud, their clothes never wore out. In the cloud, there was not a feeble one among them. In Amen. the cloud, they knew the direction of which way to go, north, south, east, or west. In the cloud, they knew whether to go or whether to stay. <laughs> Everything Amen. in the presence. Now, what happens, we get caught up with a lot of other things, and we don't mm. remember his presence with us. Yes. Even though he's still going to protect us. Because his presence is always there. Amen. You know, if I don't feel the anointing, does that mean his presence left me? No. Oh, you know, I mean, it's not about an emotion. It's about a fact of what the word of God says. God's presence is with me and he'll never leave me to the end of the age. But when I forget about that constant reminder I don't lose his presence, but I lose the confidence of his presence. There's a big difference. <laughs> you know, when I'm in church and the glory of God is everywhere, you know what I'm saying? You, you've been there. Yeah. Woo, it's strong. It's, it's rich. It's, it's emotional. You know, I've never been tempted in that situation. You know, it's only not that, that his presence was more at that moment. It's that a group of people became sensitive to his presence at that moment. His presence is as powerful when I don't feel it as it was in that service when everybody was falling out and being touched by the power of God. Amen. But what happens is... We don't lose the presence, we lose the confidence. See, when that anointing fell, we were confident God's going to take care of me. God is right here. God is fighting for me. God's going to provide for me. God's given me direction. Who I can feel it. See the confidence? Mm -hmm. But when we're not aware of the cloud, we begin to lose our confidence in that presence. And, and here's what we have to do. We have to move with the cloud. So we don't know. They didn't know in numbers. What's the cloud going to do? See, you know, they didn't get a letter or a postcard. Or they didn't get a text from God saying, in three days, the cloud's going to lift. And we're going to move northeast at 10 degrees. <laughs> they didn't get that. He just said, look, when I move, you better move. Yes. And so what would happen, they would see that cloud lift. And they, they learn, it's lifting. You know what that means? Pack up the tabernacle. Pack up our tent. Get all of our clothes packed. The, the presence is lifting. We're fixing to go somewhere. Sometimes Ooh. it would stay a long time. Sometimes it would only be one day to the next morning. You never know when he's going to move or which direction he's going to move in. You just have to always be ready to move with the cloud. Amen. Move with his presence. Always, not just in a church service, in your own personal life, at home. And, you know, I know you know what I'm talking about. I can tell. I, I'm going to try to explain this. See if I can find a pen. You know, when it talks about being in Christ, you've read that in your Bible, in Christ. Can you yes. see that? See, in the Greek language, see that circle? I don't know if you can see it or not. So that's Christ, okay? Or that's the Spirit. Either one. That's God. And I'm in, see that X? That's me. Where am I? In. In who? In Christ. Christ. In the Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. I'm in. But, you know, there's a lot of variations of in. <laughs> <laughs> See? Because that little mark on the edge 
is also in. <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. The only difference is I'm dead center here. But I've drifted to the edge. You see what's happened? Mm -hmm. I'm still in Christ, but I'm on the edge of his presence. Now, here's what can happen. I get too close to the edge, and I move out here. Yes. I'm no longer in. I'm no longer in. This is what the Greek means, by the way, by the word I am. This is just a Greek explanation. I'm in Christ. Out here, I'm no longer in the Spirit. I may be close to the Spirit, but I'm not in the Spirit. <laughs> the, the place that we need to be is in the cloud. We need to stay in the cloud. So that means you need to be ready. Because yes. God on purpose doesn't tell you what he's going to do. <laughs> Have you learned that? Mm -hmm. That God doesn't a lot of times tell you ahead of time what he's going to do? <laughs> True. Do you know why? Because if he told you ahead, you would run. <laughs> <laughs> See, he has to get you ready spiritually for what he's going to do in you. Yes, if he told you ahead of time, listen, if God would have told me 40 years ago I would have been in Africa ministering, I would have laughed at whoever told me. But you wouldn't believe the years of things that God had to take me through to prepare me to be able to hear go to Africa and obey. But what made sure I would do that so long as I stayed in the cloud. So it's very critical. Paul is saying, stay in the cloud, stay in the cloud, stay in the cloud. <clears throat> and he also says here an interesting thing. So they all went through the cloud and they were all baptized in the sea right? We read that. They all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses. That's what it says. There's two baptisms, the water and the spirit, the cloud and the sea. Even in the Old Testament, there were two baptisms. They all passed through the sea they all passed through the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so he said, they all went through the sea. They were baptized in to Moses. <clears throat> all of Israel identified with Moses because they were baptized into who? Into Moses. That's what it says. All passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses. So what, along with Israel, were also some Gentiles. I don't know if you knew that. <clears throat> when they left Egypt, some Gentiles went with them. Yeah. You know, some Gentiles saw the favor of God, and they also saw the judgment of God. And so they <laughs> said, you know, Listen, I ain't stupid. I'm going with these guys. <laughs> and so a lot of them, some of the Israelites, I mean, some of the Egyptians were won over to God by Israel. Mm -hmm. So they became an Old Testament convert. Some of them were slaves. Yes. But they followed him. They yeah. said, we... I believe in the God of Israel, so I'm going to go with Amen. Israel. So there were Gentiles right. with Israel. Amen. And all of Israel, which included Gentiles, mm -hmm. had to go through the sea. In other yeah. words, they were saying, I am identifying. No longer do I identify with Egypt. 
and the idols of Egypt and the ways of, but I'm identifying with Moses and the law and all of the things that Israel represents. Mm. We are baptized into Christ. In our baptism, we identify with the things of the kingdom of God. And so we say, I'm no longer through baptism. I'm dead to my old self and alive to living in Christ, living the kingdom lifestyle. So they were baptized into Moses. We're baptized into Christ. An interesting thing, where baptism comes from. There's so much misunderstanding about new covenant baptism. A lot. And I, I hear it all. It, it's according to who you hang with. <laughs> You hear a lot of variations, <laughs> let me tell you. It's back to, the, you can go to the conference, and this guy preaches this, and everybody says amen, and then you go to the conference, and they preach that, and everybody says amen. <laughs> the opposite. But baptism was an Old Testament sacrament. It's not a New Testament, it's an Old Testament thing. Mm -hmm. And before a Gentile, could become a true Israelite, he had to do three things. One, he had to say and confess, I come into the yoke of the law. Are we together? They yeah. had to make a pledge. I yoke myself together with the law of Moses. Yeah. They had to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. And they had to go through a spiritual bath ceremony. Yeah, mikvah. That we call, yes, that we call baptism. They had to go through that in order to be accepted. And, yeah. and it wasn't just the Israelites that practiced this. Uh, ancient Egyptians practiced it. You know, baptism yeah. is a part of many different cults. And yeah. a lot of the cults just show it as a form of purification, a cleansing yeah. from evil. Uh, you know, uh, it was a method to remove oh. uncleanliness. For sort of a rite of passage. For some, it was a rite of passage. Yeah. So if a Jew touched a dead body, he had to take all of his He's clothes, trouble. wash all of his clothes, and be baptized. He had to take a spiritual bath. To a lot of times he had to stay out of camp, too. Yeah. So there had to be this spiritual bathing process. Uh, the warriors, when they came back from battle, they all had to go through a spiritual baptism. Yeah. To wash off the spirit of murder. Any kind of spirits that would have gotten on them from the enemy that they warred against to remove any of that uncleanness. So they, those warriors would go through a baptism. Also, mm -hmm. the Jews and other cult practices believed that evil spirits cannot cross running water. <laughs> so it was like, you know, the, the Jews and all, they all kind of borrowed from one another and it was all just a spiritual practice. Not that it did that thing. It was just a practice to remind them that I've been cleansed by the blood of that animal. Now, Israel comes along and, you know, they have the, set, they have the temple and they have the laver. Remember, the, the blood first through the brazen altar, then the laver, the water. It was a symbol of cleansing. The proselytes, in order to become a Jew, you had to go through all of this. But an interesting thing that really gets to me when you come to the New Covenant <clears throat> is, uh, let me read it to you. Uh, well, I think it's in Matthew, I think Matthew 12, I'm not sure. Matthew 12, and Jesus said, Oh, here it is. Matthew 11. So, you know, I, I got to understand everybody that Jesus is, that Paul is speaking to here in Corinth, 
uh, you know, they understood everything I'm telling you <laughs> because they were Jews. You understand? I have to kind of give you a culture background, but so yes. And and John in Matthew chapter eleven verse twenty four. At that time, Jesus said, uh, no, 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. As soon as they saw, take my yoke upon you, as soon as they heard that, what do you think they thought about? the proselytes that had to pledge to take the yoke of the law upon them. But Jesus says, look, you're weary, you're burdened, you know, you're heavy. Well, let me tell you this, he says, take my yoke. Mm -hmm. Not so much be yoked with the law, but be yoked with me and learn of me from gentle and I'm humble and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy. And my burden. And my burden is light. Let me tell you a, a good way to determine whether you're involved in a Christian activity or a non-Christian activity. If whatever you're doing becomes hard and heavy, it's not Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because his way is easy and light. And he says, take my yoke upon you. The yoke of grace. The yoke of the new covenant. Not the yoke of the law. And so he's talking about, you know, the baptism and the yoke of the law. And, you know, John the Baptist is baptizing. And they all knew this. You got to understand, they knew everything I told you. So they're going, well, what is this? Well, this is a baptism for cleansing, right? Repentance. Well, you do know that baptism had no real new covenant meaning until after Jesus' death. Right? So all of, even yeah. John's baptism was not new covenant. He was preparing yeah. the way. Mm. He was preparing the way of the kingdom. And so they were still doing this ritual cleansing. And they were coming out to the Jordan. And they were watching them be cleansed. But it wasn't because he said, now this is my baptism. This is my baptism, John the Baptist. But there's another baptism. <laughs> A lot more significant than the baptism that I'm baptizing. Mm. So what you've seen through John the Baptist, John the Baptist even perceived it because he talked about it was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And here's John baptizing people. And what did John say? I need what you have. <laughs> Why am I baptizing you in this old covenant yes. cleansing? Yes. Ceremonial cleansing. I want to be baptized with your baptism, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Of course, that couldn't come until Christ was glorified, according to John. Yeah. So, it, you know, we find him, Paul, referring back to Israel, the history of Israel. Uh, I wanted to make this point here. Uh, They were baptized with a water baptism in the new covenant. It's you're basically saying, I forsake everything and I am now connected with this new way, <clears throat> the way of the kingdom. Uh, but you know, the, the whole thing, it says, here it is. For most of them, their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Wow because they got their eyes off of God, got them under their problems, got involved, you know, remember Moses went to get the law and when he came down what Aaron did, we all know, you know, they took all their earrings, and jewelry, and yes, they made yes, a calf. Yes, ornaments. 
I've, I've thought many times they had to be my sign. <laughs> it's just a thought. In my mind, it's like only a Maasai would think, listen, if we need another substitute God, it has to be a cow. <laughs> I mean, that's what they were thinking. It has to be a cow. So they, when Aaron, when Moses comes down, you remember what Aaron told them? This, you know, sin is stupid. You know, sin is really stupid. I mean, just look back when you were younger, some of the sins you committed. It's like, my God, that was stupid. Yeah. So they tell, Aaron tells Moses, where did this, he says, where did this golden calf come from? And Aaron says, well, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> we threw our earrings in the fire and out jumped a cow. <laughs> it's in the Bible. Out jumped this golden cow. And it says that they were dancing around the golden calf and all kinds of sexual immorality and orgies and stuff. And God was not pleased with them, Moses said. And because of that, their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Whole generation. You know, it was a very short trip. They could have done this trip in about 10 days, but it took them 40 years. <laughs> I mean, they could have done this thing quick. You know, our journey to reach what God wants us to reach is not a long distance. Amen. You know, it's like, look, let me show you. If I want to leave here and go see my son in Dallas, Texas, okay? Yeah. And here's Houston right here. And here's Dallas. Can you see those two marks? Yes. yes. Okay, so here's Houston. I want to go to Dallas. It's about a four hour drive. So, you know, four hours. Huh, four hours. Or I can go from here and I can go down to the beach and then I can go back over this way and visit and then I can go here. Then I can go way up here and then I can come back down again and and then I can go up and then I can come back and then I can, you know, I can take a long time to get to Dallas. <laughs> yeah. And we'll get to our destiny if we'll move with the cloud. Mm. And we don't have to experience all of the tragedy, mm. all of the difficulties that we experience like Israel did because their focus got off. And you know, in Joshua chapter one, the Bible says, well, I'll, I'll, let me just read it to you. Joshua chapter one, <laughs> there's a real significance in this. Joshua one, verse one, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, and that, that's when he told him, to get ready to cross over. But why does it say after the death of Moses? Because Moses represented the law. Mm -hmm. And Joshua is the same name for Jesus. Mm. And what the Bible yeah. is trying to tell us is the law will never get you into the promised land. Only mm. Jesus can get you into the promised land. The land that flows with milk and honey can only come through grace, not by the law. If you're trying to get to the land that flows with milk and honey through the law, you will find yourself zigzagging all over the map. But if you'll keep your focus, and if you'll understand that it's grace that gets you to your destiny, you won't waste a lot of years approaching your destiny. Moses, the representative of the law, cannot get you to the promised land. Only Jesus and the grace of God can get you there. Amen. There's no other way to get there. Now, he went on and he said that, that we shouldn't lust after the evil things that they lusted after. We should not become idolaters as some of them had become. Well, you know, when I, when I say, 
idolaters. <clears throat> you know, we all think, you know, I don't have a little golden Buddha. You know, I don't have a, a parakeet that I'm worshiping. <laughs> you know, object. Yeah, I don't I don't have an object. I'm not an idol worshiper. But you know, in that culture, they had real idols. And one of them, one of their idols was Aphrodite, the goddess of love and fertility. And everybody, it's in every one of us, to want relationship. God built us as relational people. And so they begin to go after the goddess of Aphrodite and burn incense and offer sacrifices, trying to fill that hole that was in them for love. And so they thought an idol could do that. Another idol was the idol Poseidon. That's the, the god of the sea. And because Corinth was right there by the sea, you know, it was a, a large fishing area which meant a lot of money. So they would go to the temple of Poseidon and offer incense and sacrifice and pray, God, send salmon, send tilapia, send the fish, because we are a fishing economy and we need a lot of fish. So, you know, these were some of the idols that they had. And we, of course, laugh and think, you know, come on. But we have idols. You know, we don't have the idol Aphrodite, but we have other places that we try to fill that need for love. You know, we have apps here called Tinder and dating apps and connect with people and, and that can become an idol. And, and Poseidon was about money. And money can become an idol. You know? Instead of God being number one, listen, I'm after money. I'm pursuing money with everything I have. I'm pursuing relationships. God's number three or number four. And God's not number one. Anything that comes before number one is an idol. Whatever it is. It might be yourself. Sometimes we idolize ourselves. We become number one. Let me tell you what sin is. You really need to get this in your heart and in your head. Sin is trying to fulfill a God-given desire any other way than God's way. Sin is trying to fulfill a God-given desire outside of God's providence. So if I'm looking for love, that desire is a God-given desire. So do I get an escort? That's man's way to fulfill a God-given desire. See, the desire is godly, but the fulfillment can become sin. Yes, yes, yes. So these desires inside of us are good things. But once we try to move outside of the realm of God to satisfy that desire, it becomes an idol. Anything that comes before fulfilling those things, God's way. And God was very upset with them. You know, let me, if I, if I had an envelope here, and I, and I said to you, Timo, there's uh, $500 in this envelope, and I'm going to give it to you. Mm. Hallelujah. And then when you get that, I tell you now, over there, over there in the corner is a box. Yeah. And in that box is over $2,000 worth of stuff. Some of it's a lot of cash. Some of it's just a lot of things. If you give me that 500, you give me the 500, you can have that box over there that's worth a lot. Most people would say, well, here's the 500, right? 
and you go to look in the box, but the box was empty. <laughs> I lied to you. Yeah. You already had in your possession $500. Mm. But you believed a lie and ended up with nothing. Ooh. And God has given us so much. But here's the thing. One of the things of the flesh is this statement. Enough is never enough to the flesh. Listen to this again. Enough is never enough to the flesh. So see, here's what happens. God gives us enough. God is more than enough. Right? He yes. gives us himself. He's more than enough. But it's not enough. Yeah. We're looking for more. And that's where the devil slips in. And he starts saying, go after this over here. And that's when you begin to move to the edge of the cloud. Edge of the ledge. And you get to that edge. And the devil's saying, go ahead, just three more steps and you're going to get there. You're going to get that $5,000 worth of stuff. Come on, just another step. Just another. You're already in Christ. You're already in the spirit. You've already got the God of more than enough. But the enemy says, no, just a little further. Come on, and you'll get enough. But you have to remember when that's going on, enough is never enough to the flesh. Mm. The flesh will never be satisfied. Yeah. The flesh will never be satisfied. You know, there's multi, multi millionaires here in the U.S. And somebody asked him, what more do you want? You've already got 50 million U.S. dollars. What more do you want? And this is what he answered. One more million. <laughs> because enough is never enough just a little bit more i just have to have more i just have so what happens that's why paul said i've learned to be content yeah with a lot and i've learned to be content with a little now you know it's easy for us to learn to be content with a lot we love that school <laughs> we love the school and I, I got to teach you to start living with twice of what you get paid now we're like amen I'm a good student Jesus amen oh, amen me. to live with twice the income I have now I'm all ears <laughs> but when God says now I want to teach you to learn with uh, live with a little uh oh See, Paul had to learn both. He did. You know, a lot of people that are that are rich, a lot of people look at them and go, man, I want to be rich. Let me tell you something. Rich without the learning is dangerous. Oh, mm. man. Poison. If you haven't been through the school of Christ to handle the riches, you don't want them. It'll destroy you. You're and right. Many have been destroyed. And so we have to, we have to, listen, be satisfied with where God has you. Amen. Be content Amen. with, listen, Amen. if God wants to give you more, Amen. hell can't stop him. That's true. Amen. So and the reason we don't have more is we haven't learned we haven't learned to be faithful with what we've got. You're right. And by faithful, I mean willing to give. That's true. Where to invest. Being, working hard. You know, working hard, that's not the curse. Adam and Eve worked before the fall. Yeah. The curse was it became work. 
<laughs> it wasn't ministry anymore. Yeah, they were loving it before, but now after the curse, they were sweating. I mean, it was tough. I had some weeds up in there. Yeah, but here's what God wants us to get. Be content in your journey. Amen. Don't be looking to the sexual immorality. Don't be looking to all of the idols. Don't be looking. That's what Paul is saying. Look, we should be learning from Israel. We have an advantage. We can read their history and go, you know what? I'm not going to be stupid like them. I can read their history. And they were scattered through the wilderness because they weren't. So these idols, you know, an idol is a misorder of life. An idol is a misorder of life. It should be God first and a lot of different things after that, right? Yes. But an idol is when your life gets misordered. Mm -hmm. And maybe your job becomes more important than God. Or your church, your ministry becomes more important than God. Preaching can become more important than God. Money can become more important. So, see, idolatry is a misorder of life. Listen, that's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. Amen. If you'll seek my kingdom first, your life will be in order and all of these things will be added to you. But once you get a misorder of life, you end up with an idol. Listen, idolatry, I want you to catch this. Idolatry is the sin underneath the sin. Idolatry is the sin that's underneath the sin. So let's say you begin to covet. The sin beneath the sin is I want something God hasn't given me yet. Mm. So I'm going to steal. The sin underneath the sin is an idol. The sin underneath that sin, there's always an idol there. Trying to satisfy a God-given desire outside of his providence. So we seek to fulfill these things. Why do we lie? What is the idol behind lying? Self-promotion. Yeah, I want, I want people to look up to me. Or I don't want to look bad. And so I'll just tell them. Mm. So the sin underneath that sin is an idol. There's always yes. an idol. It's always something you've put before God. And that's why Jesus is like, look, look, let's just, Cut to the chase. Let's just make this simple, okay? Seek first my kingdom. <laughs> seek first my kingdom. Just seek first my kingdom. Just keep seeking my kingdom. All idols are just counterfeit gods. And a counterfeit god can never satisfy you. Yes. Because you're made in the image of God, only the things of God can satisfy you. Mm. Because you're made in his image. So you know what's crazy? Amen. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to give you <laughs> wisdom. God says, I'm going to be all these things to you. Okay. Then the devil tells a yes. lie. The devil tells us a lie. You, you just have 500. <laughs> that box over there has thousands in it. Now, here's my question. Why would we believe a lie of the devil when you have the promise of God? Mm. Why would we substitute a promise from God with a lie from Satan? Well, Satan seems to promise us things that happen quicker. Yeah, but see, that again, that becomes an idol. I want to get there faster. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So we're not content with where we are in our journey. No. And that becomes no. an idol. You're right. So it's like, you know what? I want to be beyond this. I want my church to be running a thousand, not 500. So to do that, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and this. You stepped out of the cloud and all hell breaks loose in your church. That's what happens. Why do we believe? Listen, we know Satan's a liar. We know he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We know, listen, he doesn't even know what the word promise is. Because his word means nothing. There's no such thing as a promise to a liar. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but when God promises and has never lied, yeah, never lied, and he promises you something, and you can read, there's 30,000 of them in this book. Promises. Amen. He's never broke one. And yet, we will substitute those promises with a promise from Satan. You're right. And you know what? You know what ends up happening? Shipwrecked faith. Mm -hmm. Their faith ends up being shipwrecked. Who was that? Yes. Hymenaeus and Alexander. Yes. Shipwrecked faith, Paul said to Timothy. Yep. You know, look, he said, look, if your faith is in God and that God's leading and protect, leave your faith there. You don't need some other promise. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need another promise, mm -hmm. but here it is. Yeah. See? Yeah, I do. Cause all <laughs> of the promises that I have from God, they're not enough yeah. because enough is never enough. Enough yes. is never enough to the flesh. And then well, it always goes back to what you say, Don. It's, if you're not building the kingdom of God, you're building the kingdom of self. Yeah. yeah. And self can never be satisfied. Never. Never. Never will. And that's that why Jesus was so adamant about the kingdom. Amen. He knew the kingdom yeah. would help us to keep spiritual equilibrium. You're right. Seeking the kingdom first keeps your life in balance. Yeah. And once you start getting away from that, you move towards that outer circle. You're right. Because the devil is promising you something more. But the devil <laughs> can never fulfill a promise of something more than what God has promised you. Never. Never. He's never going to fulfill a promise. He doesn't know what the word promise is. <laughs> now, you could say, you could tell the devil, now, will you fulfill that lie? <laughs> and he will to the twentieth power. <laughs> That's the truth. So if we can just bring our place ourselves to the place of understanding. Yeah. It's it's that song. He's got the whole world. Yeah. In his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his Amen. Hand. He's got the whole world. See, if we, but see, no, we got to have more. And that's the flesh. So if we could become content, content with where God has us. And so, you know, he talked about immorality Amen. and idols. He also said, now let us, uh, nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted. They were destroyed by serpents. And he says, don't complain. Yeah. You know, Israel, they were habitual complainers. They were. You know, I know some people, I'm, I know some people, they can, let me tell you, when they walk into a room, all the joy leaves. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, hey, I don't like you talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, I know people that are so negative, their blood is negative. <laughs> <laughs> Only you, Don Babin. <laughs> it's the I mean, best. It just doesn't matter. Let me tell you, they complain. It doesn't matter. 
I think these are the kind of people they complain on their wedding night. <laughs> <laughs> They're just gonna find something to complain about. Yeah. <laughs> and, and God was rebuking them for being complainers. Amen. He did so many Paul, times. Paul is saying, look, let's look back history and yeah. remember Israel, mm. what happened because they complained. Mm. Let, let me tell you what complaining is, just to kind of make it easy for you to understand. Complaining is you being the idol. Mm. That's good, Don. Now you're the idol. See, because that as, as little God, you're complaining, you're saying, if I was God, yeah. I would have done it this way. Yeah. Mm. yeah. See, but I'm not God, I'm not God, but if I was, none of this <laughs> would be happening. Don, see, to me, that sounds like Romans with a, where he says, does the clay talk back to the potter? Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> it does. So I know. Here, complaining is you putting yourself in God's position. That's really good. Yes. Anytime you're complaining, you know what you're saying? If I was God. I'd do it better. I'd do it better. Yeah. Oh, I'd do it a lot better than this. <laughs> and I'm not God. And I'd do a whole lot better. And it wouldn't take me near as long. <laughs> and I mean, am I right? Isn't that what complaining is? Amen. Complaining is just you saying, you know what, God, you really messed up on this one. <laughs> you should have let me be in charge. <laughs> am I right? You are. Yes. You know, God, if it was me, I'd have had this done three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you better hush. <laughs> <laughs> but next time you hear somebody complain, you just you, just, you need to help them because they just <laughs> you know they're just usually very baby Christians. As well, I don't know, Don. I've I've been doing it some lately. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you this though I, I can promise you something what your complaining will never change God's perspective amen wow hey wow. he's not a man but he should wow. love you nor is he he never you, changes gripe you can complain scream yeah. holler kick and spit He's like, look, I know you're screaming that this should have already happened, <laughs> but I already got the date set. You're right. So it doesn't matter how you want to get there. If you want to take 40 years to get there or just well, a good. few days, that's up to you. We are going to get good. there. We're going to get there. You got it. That's now you good. can drive the whole way and take a whole generation. <laughs> yes. But Hold God promised they were going to get to the land of milk and honey, and they did. Wow. Amen. And by the way, that's, that's the land of milk and honey. Because I've heard some people, they preach like it's the land of silk and money. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> It's the land um, of milk and honey. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we're complaining about. And they're still, right. they got in the promised land. And they're yeah, they still did. complaining. <laughs> still. <laughs> it's like, you still. Know, God, you brought us all the way over here. Did you know there are giants in the land? Where <laughs> were you when these giants were created? <laughs> I mean, have you seen the size of this guy? <laughs> <laughs> enough is never enough. 
You're right, Don. <laughs> it's just never enough. But that's uh, good. That's good. Anyway, and so he says here, all these things happen as an example. Yeah. Upon whom the end of the ages have come. You know, we live in a different age. They died in the wilderness. They were bitten by snakes. I mean, God killed 23,000 of them, but we're in the age of grace. We are. So remember, I started, look at all these things that these people did. I mean, this church of Corinth, I mean, look at the things that they were involved in. I'm talking. I mean, sick. listen, <coughs> they need to be glad Paul was the pastor. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> this knows what I'm saying. <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying. I'd have, I'd have shot them and told God they died. <laughs> Don, Don, <laughs> Don, you'd have done like a hillbilly. You'd have shucked some corn. <laughs> so, you know, so here's all of this going on in this church. And here's what Paul says about him in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to this. I always thank God for you. <laughs> <laughs> he knew all this. Yeah. He said, <laughs> I thank God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him you've mm. been enriched in every way. Wow. In all your wow. speaking and your knowledge, because of our testimony about Christ, with you don't lack in any spiritual gift. <laughs> wow. And then he calls them faithful. Oh my God! And you I think he's that. calling those things. I think he's calling those <laughs> things to be not as though they are. <laughs> you see, <laughs> his perspective of Corinth was a father's perspective. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't expect. I don't expect. You know my one-year-old son to get out there and take care of the yard. Yeah. Paul didn't expect the church of Corinth born in an ungodly city <clears throat> to be at a place that they couldn't be at yet. Yes. And so even with all of this, he said, you see Israel, look at what they went through. But we're in a different age. We're in the age of grace. And Amen. you're still enriched. And God is still faithful. And God loves you. And God's never going to leave you. And God's presence is there. I'm going to tell you, grace is always better than the law. And then Paul said, and I'm going to wrap it up. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands takes heed, Take heed lest he fall. Now, yeah. let me make a point. I've heard this many people say, the devil knows your weakness. Well, <clears throat> listen to this. The devil, most of the time, doesn't attack your weakness. He attacks your strength. Because in your weakness, you're guarded. You know, good. you know that's a weak area of your life. So you're, that's good. you're looking for promises in God's word over that weakness in your life. That's you're really able good. to receive words and ministry to strengthen that area that you're weak. So the devil has a hard time attacking you in your weakness. But where you're strong, it's not guarded. So you have to take heed because in our pride, we think I'm so strong here, the devil will never get to me. You see, mm. Peter, he, you know, Peter, he wasn't committing adultery when Jesus rebuked him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They get thee behind me, you adulterer. <laughs> get behind me, you idol worshiper. No, because see, he was faithful, faithful to Jesus. And the devil attacked him in his strength. And that's why he said, not me. Listen, I'll, I'll die for you. 
You see, it's, you see, that's my strong point. And he said, get thee behind me because you think like a man. Your thoughts are from men. Wow. The enemy will go after your strengths more than he will your weakness because you've left that area unguarded just like Peter did. <clears throat> and it's unguarded because of pride. So you have to take heed. Take heed lest you fall. And, and he goes on to say, God's going to leave a way out of this. Tem Listen, he doesn't leave, give you a way out of the temptation. And temptation in the sin, Jesus was tempted. But he gives you a way out of giving in to the temptation. Are we together in that? Yes. Imagine going down a highway. And you see those signs, you know, that says exit. It's coming up. Here's the exit off the highway. Yes. That's God providing a way of escape. You're headed down the highway, you're being tempted, and God gives you a sign that says right up here, very close, is an exit. Get off the highway. I, I made an exit off of this temptation so that you don't fall. Now, if you don't take that exit, if you'll go a little further down the road, what are you going to find? Another exit. <laughs> But the problem is, the further away you get, the less exits you're going to see. Yes. So he's always going to give you an exit off of that highway of temptation. But if you keep refusing the exits, one day there's not going to be that exit. Now here's the thing. He's saying all of this about sin and temptation. Remember, you have to take everything. You know, I keep saying this to you. You know, I'm a covenant, I believe in covenant theology. Maybe we ought to review the covenant, but I believe that all of my debts were swallowed up and the assets of God, all of my sins are gone completely. <laughs> I'm the righteousness of God in Jesus. So let's say I don't take the exit and I sin. Do I need to fall on my face and plead with God for forgiveness? Or is God allowing that to happen to make me wiser so that I can achieve my destiny at his timetable? You see, it's not about sin. It's about him taking you somewhere. It's about your own personal journey. Your sin's dealt with on the cross. And if you have to suffer for that sin, then what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough. So, you know, it's, we become too sin conscious and not grace conscious. So when you study the Bible, study it with grace in front of your eyes. So what is Paul talking about here? He's talking about a journey. A journey. Yes. And there's a lot of obstacles in this journey. But I live in the age of grace and my sins are forgiven and I'm justified. However, if I keep taking these detours and zigzagging, it's longer for me to get to the destiny that God has for me. It's the love and the compassion of God. He allows these temptations, according to James chapter 1, to give me character and strength and endurance. That's why he allows temptation and trials in our life. And even Jesus was tempted. And we're all tempted. And some people think, you know, Paul says we're all, there's no temptation that's not common to man. Listen, every temptation that you've gone through, everybody else has gone through. <laughs> I mean, you're not so special. God's, the Satan's going to design one just for you. He doesn't have to come up with a new trick. The old ones still work. <laughs> you know, why should he design a new trick? It's like, man, listen, I've been using these same ones for 10,000 years. I'll just stick with those. They're still working on these stupid people. <laughs> That's what he does. You know? So God allows this in our life to do what? To make us wise. Amen. So that I can say, whoa, you know what? I'm taking that exit. I learned the last 500 times if I don't yeah. take it, I'm going to crash. So, you know, I'm taking that exit. And then you take it and it's like, hallelujah, that was awesome. That was awesome. You're getting closer to your destiny. 
God's taking you somewhere. God's going to get you there. Rest Amen. assured. Rest assured. It's God that worketh in you to will and to do his good pleasure. It's God working in you, even in the hard times, even in the temptations, even when you sin. And, you know, I think I've told you all this. And I don't want to make light of sin because of what Jesus did on the cross. I'll never make light of sin. But you do know that Jesus isn't half as surprised as you are when you sin. Hmm. You know, <laughs> Jesus doesn't go, I can't believe he did that. You know, he's a God that knows all things. Yeah. Man. He's the all-knowing God. So God yeah. knew I was going to do what I did before I did it. Yeah. So if God knows what you're going to do before you did it, that means you can never use the word if only. Because if only suggests an alternative. Mm. And there is no alternative to God's plan for your life. Yes. So you just say, you know what, God, I'm learning in this journey. I'm learning in this journey that I'm going through, and I know you're a faithful God, and I know you love me, and I know I'm going to get there, but God, I want to take the short route. So I'm going to seek first your kingdom, and I know that it's you that worketh in me to will and to do of your good pleasure. And I don't care how strong the devil is and how much of a liar he is. You beat the devil on the cross. You defeated him. You crushed him. And because of that, he's crushed in my life. And all the devil is to you is a pawn that God uses. The devil can't do anything to you unless God allows him. So he's a pawn. You know, do y'all play chess? Any of y'all know what the game chess is? You know, in chess, you sit on this side of the table and you make a move, right? And then what does the other person does? He studies it and he makes a move, right? So I'm, I make a move and I'm over here and this is God. This is God in my life. So I make a move and the devil's over there. And the devil makes a move because he wants to attack my king. Yeah. Right? But the only thing is when the devil makes a move, God made him make the move that he made. <laughs> And God also knows the end of the game. Mm. God knows every move the devil's going to move to try to take my king, but God also knows that I'm going to win the game. Amen. Amen. So the devil's just a pawn in the hand of God to help me to achieve my destiny. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <Right>. Chapter 10. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I know we covered a lot, but... <clears throat> We'll get, we'll talk about the Lord's Supper. I'll explain why it says, you know, if you take unworthily, you could die. How can you take unworthily if the blood of Jesus is already right? Everything you read, yes. you, you, can't, you can't shift. I'm going to keep saying that. You can't go from grace to law, grace to law. So, you know, some people preach that. Mm -hmm. You took of the Lord, you're going to die young. Well, I thought Jesus died for my sins. Now I have to die too. <laughs> I guess what Jesus did wasn't enough. Yeah. So I guess I'm going to have to die. No, Jesus said, I took care of all that. So why would he say if you take it unworthily? So you have to interpret the word of God in light of the word of God. You can't just read that Amen. and not understand grace, or you're going to preach grace over here and then law this Sunday, and then next Sunday a little bit of grace, the next five Sundays law, and then the next Sunday a little bit of grace, and your church is going to be a bunch of Judaizers. Mm. In other words, I believe in living by the law and grace. Mm. And you can't do both, right? Yes. Well, amen. Amen. I love you, Pastor Innocent. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> well, I hope y'all are learning. Yeah, it's good. It has been so, oh man, I'm so blessed. I Very good. 
I love you, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, I love y'all. We need to get together, man. Go eat somewhere where we don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> where is that? <laughs> In Kenya. Yeah. I think you have to strain your food through a mask. I guess you drink a malt through a mask. <laughs> Take our flights to Kenya. Yeah. Well, anyway, man, I love y'all. <laughs> I miss y'all so much. I want to get there. Pray that I can come there. Pray for Hendrik, my friend, to be healed. Yes. Throat so cancer. Get the word out to the churches. I, I'm, I'm waiting to hear him say, Pastor Innocent, I don't think you heard. I have a friend of mine. His name is Hendrik. He's a pastor. I don't know. He has cancer. Mm -hmm. And he's a, he's a huge supporter of our ministry. And uh, he has cancer mm. in his throat. And he sent me a message, said, please pray for me. Have your friends pray for me. Uh, he's supposed to go to a hospital to have a biopsy. And I told him in faith, by the time you get there, it's going to be gone. In Jesus' mm -hmm. name, yes. So let's all agree mm. together. When he gets there, the cancer's gone. Amen. So mm. have your church pray, innocent. For His name is Hendrik. He's a South Hendrick. African. He's a South African. A great guy. Oh. So y'all be praying. Dennis, have mm. your church pray for Hendrik. Okay. I know y'all do on yeah. fight night. Yeah. You call my name out still? Yeah. <laughs> Even now I'm some you call my name out. Yeah. Yeah. This... <laughs> Don't you forget my name, Dennis. <laughs> Trinity is not your name. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pray for you all. I love you yeah. all so much. And uh we'll love you too. And you next week. Father, we love you. I thank you that yes, you're Lord. working in each one of us. We can never exhaust your yes, grace. Lord. I thank you that mm. you're leading us in our own journeys. And that, God, you have mm. more than enough for all of us. Mm. Help us to be satisfied in you. Help us not to complain mm. and to make ourselves idols. Help us, God, not to yes, look to these idols in life, but to seek first your kingdom. And we know when we do that, everything will be taken care of. Thank you, God, that you love us with the endless, measureless love. A, a mm. love that can never be exhausted. A divine, yes, supernatural love that goes beyond anything a human brain can comprehend. Mm. Thank you for that love for mm. us. And that that love lives in us and will never leave us. In Jesus' name, amen. I love amen. you. I you, and I'll send you a recording of what we did today. Thank you. Love you. Yes. Love all of you. Uh, say hi I to Michelle. I will. Say hi to my Michelle. I will. Bye, Franklin. Bye-bye. And say hi to Pastor Jen also. We miss I will. her. I, I will. I love you all. Thank bye. you. Bye.